Hi, I'm artist Luann Stovall. Welcome to the Fashion Hour at ACC Fashion Incubator. Thank you so much for joining us here for Fashion Hour. Uh, my name is Nina Means. I'm the director here for the Austin Community College Fashion Incubator. We do have our website here um, at austincc.edu backslash fashion incubator, as well as um, you can follow us for any additional content on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter for um, at ACC Fashion Incubator. Uh, we have our hashtags. If you take pictures or video and you want to tag us in those videos, we will repost that on our stories today. So you'll see us um, grab your content and put it back up on our site as well. So you'll get a chance to see those images. Um, I think some of you did that during National Small Business Week last week. So we definitely thank you for participating in that. Um, just additional housekeeping. Um, this is available for... Um, on ACC TV on channel 19. So if you've missed any of the fashion hours from before, this is episode 104, um, but you can see 101 through 103 on channel 19 on the ACC TV. We're also live streaming today for your ease. Um, so I wanted to um, also just kind of introduce our topic today. We're talking about the color of fashion. We're looking at psychology and marketing and how, you know, what we do in terms of art translates into fashion. Um, so we're looking at um, uh, some contemporary art from our lovely guest, uh, Luann Stovall, and also talking about how that translates into garment and how that, the color has been used through time um, with Michelle Washington. So let me get a little bit more into these two ladies because we're really pleased to have them here with us. So Luann Stovall um, is a Master's of Fine Arts graduate from Tufts University. She's also a lecturer over at the School of Fine Arts at the University of Texas. And she has done an incredible job um, as a contemporary gallery artist. Um, you see her work here on either side. Um, we'll get more into the series of art that goes behind those two works. Um, but we also have Michelle Washington, who is um, our instructional coordinator here at the Fashion Incubator. But she's also an incredible, um, she's, we brought her on because of these things, okay? So let me tell you all about her. She um, is a GQ insider. She um, has done um, incredible work in the industry for various brands like Nike and Hagar, um, but she's also been teaching in higher ed for a number of years. Um, I would say definitely almost 15 years teaching. Plus. Plus, plus. So, we, so she's really had a lot of great experience teaching at the academic level. So we're so pleased to have Michelle Washington join us today. Um, so thank you so much for being here. So the color of fashion. So Luann, you know, we're in a place um, where art is getting a lot more exposure. You know, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, um, and we're really kind of in the middle of the West Austin studio tour. So if you walk through here, you would have seen a lot of the artwork um, that's a part of the studio tour here in Austin. Um, but, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and um, what you're doing with your art these days? Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here and thank you all for coming. Um, I am so excited to be able to do this uh, because of exactly what what we're coming together to talk about. So I actually, uh, I was raised by an art teacher dad uh, in Ohio. So I've been doing art since I was about this big and I'm a, I'm a painter so my, my practice is very color focused. But in the recent years I, I began to really think about a different kind of idea about what I was working on and that kind of turned into, so what you're seeing on either side is um, a series based on very modernist shapes and strong colors and clean lines and the, the, this particular series you see is uh, uh, based on the hero, it's called the hero's journey, we'll talk about it later. The hero happens to be a little tiny ant holding her head high with her leaf going home to the colony. So we're, we're learning from her. She's a, a kind of a mentor hero. But um, part of that is to think about then what, what is the purpose of art and, you know, if it, does it just go on, on a wall, does it just go into a, a gallery or a museum, or does it have another purpose? And with where we are right now in the culture, I'm thinking about this higher purpose and I'm thinking about art for daily life. That's great. 
So um, part of your um, title is that you're also a color theorist. Can you tell us a little bit more about what a color theorist does? Right, that's a good question. <laughs> So I went back to get my uh, master's degree at Tufts University, as Nina mentioned, and this was in 2002. So having been a painter, a gallery artist, and him show my work in, in those kind of places, I was asked by the faculty at the museum school where I was, uh, the School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston is part of Tufts University. So they asked if I would teach a color class because there hadn't been a color class that people had been wanting to take for a number of years, which is weird because you'd think that art schools would teach color. But actually, there's not too many pa people that are just doing painting because we're doing a lot of different interdisciplinary kind of work. So besides teaching painting, just paint mixing, you see my paint mixing. I'm doing palette portraits right there. I take pictures of my paint. That's how bad it is for me. That's how obsessed I am. <laughs> but, but what happened was they asked then, would you teach a color class? And I already knew that this was a, I was inheriting a failed model that it wasn't just about paint mixing. So I thought, if color is boring and people don't want to take the class, something's wrong. Something's wrong with the way we're teaching it. And so I said, hell yeah. So I asked myself a question that has changed my life and I'm continuing to explore it to this day. And that question is, what is color? And I began, and I taught the class there. We investigated color from all these different angles and, and brought in people, went to, went to Harvard, where there is the Center for you know, Visual Studies and Integrative Biology, and asked about how we see and start to look at color in the world. So I taught that there in Boston. When I came from Boston to Austin to teach at UT, I began to search for ways to teach color there. And I'm just coming off of a uh, really exciting semester that I taught for the first time, it's called the New Color. It's upper disciplinary class, interdisciplinary class across campus, students from ar ar architecture, archeology, span um, astronomy, design, fashion, um, journalism. And we had guest speakers. So uh, some of you went to the uh, Wednesday night color salons where we had all these guest speakers come in and it was open to the public as well as the students. So one of, the, one of our, it, it was really wonderful because we were able to then talk to these color experts. And one of the most, one of the extremely interesting speakers was Michelle Washington on the panel for color psychology and marketing. Absolutely, and that's why we wanted to kind of reprise that here for ACC. This is something that we wanted to, to bring to you know, our community as well. You know, um, I wanted to show just a couple of close-up images of your work for uh, the hero's journey. Um, you know, you had mentioned this whenever we were talking, um, when you were talking earlier, about just kind of how things have changed over time. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Like, how do you think you know, color has kind of evolved over time and how it's being utilized? Um, that was something that you kind of started to mention um, toward the end of your comment there. Yes, I, it's just, it actually is an extremely interesting cultural moment. And I, I think that I found, I discovered this gap in, like I said, I was asked to teach this class. And then I began to think, we live in this world of color. Every, we live in color, all of us. And why are we, what are we, what are we thinking about when we think about color? Is it just for people who put paint on canvas? I mean, you all are wearing things in color, you know, and, and you live in color and you make color choices. So, you know, so I, I began to, so the aunt, uh, our hero, she's going through, through the color field at all times of day and, and passing by other pieces of nature and showing us how to be present in the moment. But, and I think it's these codes that we pick up. Why do we wear things? What do they do for us? What do they mean? How are they connected to, to nature? What do they do for ourselves? And that's what we were exploring, you know, when, when, when we were talking about what is fashion and how does that work for fashion? Well, first of all, I'd like to say, you ladies are looking fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and when I look at Luann's paintings, which also inspired me, and these are very relevant palettes that I would love to see in fashion as well, as well as your, your home line, it strengthened that, and also in the positioning and body of the ant, there's a strength stance. But when you look at the ant right behind Nina, it starts off with the light color of yellow with a subtle sunrise, or we could say it is the sunset. But it's almost like an aura radiating from the ant itself. So it's in everything, the positioning, the palette that was chosen, the 
the leaf itself. So these are all things that, as, as we all, as artists, look at color, we're going to have our own interpretations. And yes. that's what's inspired me towards Luann's art. Absolutely. I think um, I want Luann to kind of go a little bit more into um, the art series, because I think we haven't really introduced that and how you're working with the Cultural Arts Commission. Um, you know, this is another piece from that work, and we'll get a chance to see the full capsule of the art series in just a moment. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about, you know, why you're starting with your artwork and how you're connecting it with cultural arts and, you know, why make product? What's Right. So when I made that realization about color is, I mean, it's a, it's a duh realization. Oh, yeah, we live in color. It's like, yeah, I guess we do. But it hadn't been looked at and, and art was kept separate. And I, I actually can't stand that. I just feel like it. It, it should be all around us, it, you know, and the question is, what is art? So with this series, I, I mean, the work I started to do recently in the last few years, it just felt like it was calling me to want to go. I realized it could come off. I, mean, I make the images. These are made, these are gouache on our 350 pound paper. And I realized that once I make them, she, I'm calling her a she. I'm not sure if you can tell the difference between a girl and a guy aunt, but um, I mean, I'm sure you can. I didn't mean to be like but, but uh, anyway, it just felt like the point is that uh, the things that we have on us and around us, um, the, uh, the sheets that we sleep on, the, the, you know, the, our, our everything that we, that we make, they are basically, I'm going to use that fashion term, touch points. They remind us of things like this incredible blue, that incredible, they remind us of something, they do something for us. And so I also felt like the, the patterns, the images that we have on our, around us, they can be, I can take them off the paper, they can go onto fabric. If I had the right equipment and I had the right technology, they could become, you know, they could become on the walls, they could become upholstery for the chairs, they can be rugs, they can, there can be plates and cups. And, and because she has a message to say to us, which is, you know, embrace your inner hero and um, you know, life is a hero's journey. It's tough out there, you know, but hold your head high. So it seemed like I had to be able to make that, that leap between what we were talking about a few minutes ago about art and other things that we, we have in our homes and the things we have on us. It's, it's so important to be able to fuse those two. Yeah, I want to just interject there. I think that what we want to do is we want to create the connection between art and environment, fashion, and how you wear what you you know, what you selected in terms of your colors. Um, you know, really for our two guests here, you know, Luann is really representing that side of our contemporary artist, our gallery space that really understands, you know, the color mixing and the art that goes behind this. And then I think, you know, Michelle really kind of focusing in on more about what's the application in terms of the decisions we make about what we put on our body, you know, and being able to make those connections. So we're, we're gonna continue to tell that story on both sides, but really think about it in terms of your total environment, almost lifestyle brand of things that you pick up from various parts of your life. It's cups, it's plates, it's, you know, it's your, you know, tablescape, it's your sheeting, it's, you know, your actual garments that you put on. So there's, there's opportunity to talk about the whole package, um, which is really where a lot of brands are going right now in terms of lifestyle. Well, in this day and age, we are at a serious advantage point in regards to color. Color was not available the way that it is now. It's the, from the 1940s, really, if we go back to 18, 56, where we had chemist William Perkin, who was making an experimental motion into finding, finding out in his movine, which was the color that came out of an experiment for quinine. That launched us into our synthetic revolution of color. Then, of course, Germany picked up on that color and took over 90% of the synthetic colors that are brought into the Americas. So we are at a poignant phase of color. And with that, Pantone generates that into money. Pantone sitting in New Jersey, telling us what to do, what to buy, what to wake up with, the color of the year, so on and so forth. Yeah, I love that, you know, really connecting it to history in terms of how you know, color has been perceived over time. You know, Michelle, before you get into this too far, I would love to, well, before you get to that, this is our full hero's journey capsule. Um, and so we'll talk about how that's getting translated in a product just a little bit later. 
Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about Ms. Michelle Washington here. Um, can you share a little more about your background and what you've been up to? Um, and then kind of let's go a little further with this fashion history and color. Oh boy. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> The, it's more like, what have I not done? But uh, I, am, I am mostly a TV style expert, fashion stylist. I work with magazines, fashion covers, the fashion incubator with wonderful people like Nina Means. I also work with celebrities. Um, Netflix has been one of my clients as of recent. Uh, I do a lot of partnering and ambassador representations of famous brands or about to be famous labels and brands. And it's, it's incredibly fun. Yeah. So <laughs> That's good. It's, it's always good when you get a chance to live your passions, right? You get a Absolutely. chance to spend your time doing things that you love to do. Um, you were getting a little bit before into you know, some of this history of um, color. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you know, we're seeing that Pantone's dictating you know, what's the new color of the year? Living Coral is where we are right now, I believe. Yes, living, living Coral. Have you seen it? So, they had to specify you know. that it was living. <laughs> That, that too. Um, <laughs> living coral is the color right now. You know, um, can you talk to us a little bit more about, you know, why would Pantone kind of bother to set the color for things that would be used across interiors to fashion to, you know, just for uh, our, our understanding? So you're asking me to pull back the curtain. I think we need to pull back the curtain. Yeah. I don't, I don't give this information out to everybody. Well, you know, this is what this is for. We're giving out <laughs> the information to the people. Y'all right. are special. You so are. So here we go. <laughs> so yeah, let's pull back the curtain. In the land of fashion, we do juggle a certain amount of smoke and mirrors, as we say. And the selection of color is a part of that. Uh, with Pantone, we are selecting colors of the year that we touch as touch points and also as hot buys that we put in the front of retail space. So when you walk into that favorite store of yours and there are three mannequins wearing a certain color and a certain ensemble, subconsciously, your mind is saying, where's that, where's that, where's that color? I'm looking for that color over there. But you're passing it and then you're passing it again and again until you get to the counter where there are little smaller items. But all of this color saturation is imprinting on your mind. So color is an emotional buy, it's a therapy buy, it's also confidence. You're buying confidence in a sense. You are establishing your personality by color. You make 90% of your decisions by color. It's never by does this outfit fit me or this lighting really makes me look bad. You are actually saying does this color appropriately fit me. The dress that you like in black, the shirt that you like in blue, if I change the color, will your purchasing decision be the same? And I think we know as designers that no, your decision will not be the same. Um, sometimes you have your customer um, literally in the comments online say, I wish you made this in blue. You know what we do next season? We make it in blue. Um, you know, there's not really a lot of guesswork that comes into that. Or we see that you left the red one on the rack for a little too long and we stop making it for you. You know, so it really does translate into the decisions of what comes out next, you know, every single delivery. Yes, and I was going to follow up on the timeline that Michelle brought up. By uh, the, the Textile Color Card Association of the United States was formulated, that's TCCA, in 1915, and they, uh, they put out their first. Um, color palette of the year in 1916. So you know what was going on in that time period, right? Enlighten us, please. Just so we're World all War One. And yes. so, yeah, we are. That means we are not going to be able to get the, this pipeline of, of fashion from France. You know, we're like, where do we learn from? They were like, all eyes were cast on Paris, right? And then, and then we have, as Michelle's saying, that's this new manufacturing with synthetic color. And how do we? You know, it was a riot of color, and the, you know, people were just like, if they were supposed to get buy a hat and a coat and a bag, and and then they're like, the colors don't match, and and the dyes don't look good. So so they actually had to start putting out these color cards that, and you know, so that's 19, you know, 1916. So pre, it is going to morph into Pantone. But you know, I've heard a lot of people that say, and I understand this. That's like, oh man, people are just like 
selling us, like we have to buy these colors. But you know, actually when you think about it, if it wasn't organized in some way, or the colors weren't managed, you know, or, or uh, they called it the ensemble concept, that like th these would be the colors for this year. And I think Michelle was saying that at a conversation the other day that um, you, they don't really change the colors that much. They often just change the name and tweak the saturation a little bit or like pull one forward or something. But you know, that's basically to help us not have everything be complete chaos. So now we're getting into color forecasting. Uh, when we're looking at the colors of, I want to go back to that previous slide of black and white. Two of our favorite colors. Um, black is the number one top selling color still to this day. In the days of Chanel, when she was making her famous jersey dresses, it stood for sophistication, youth, a clean palette to create edginess. And now, uh, as of the study of 2018, 183,000 dresses that are bought online, 38.5% are black. And then your second highest selling color is white. And out of 183,000 dresses again, 10.7% are white dresses. So with black, it's also a rebellious color. It's also a color palette that demonstrates the look and feel of what you want to express. We add splashes of color and it turns into something on a black palette. We will display our brooches and our jewelry and our bow ties or whatnot on a palette of black and it's emphasized even more. Uh, the fashion industry is obsessed with black. That's not going to change. But the psychology of what we add to it adds political factors. So color has now become political. Let's look at the red carpet of the Golden Globes. It was entirely covered with a theme of black for the hashtag Time's Up movement. A representation, a political factor, a rebellion. I love that. You know, I think in terms of the way that we, we experience that, you know, the decisions that you make, I mean, think about what was the last purchase you made and what color did it come in? I almost want to poll the audience and see what we get. But you know, it's, I think the numbers have already demonstrated that it's, it's a highly popular color. And honestly, we're, I, we are not seeing that go anywhere whatsoever. So Luann, you know, from your perspective, what do you see? Well, um, so I, there's some, some of my former students are out in the audience. And one of the projects we do is called Color Research. And it's the most incredible project because we have 10 basically touch points, 10 things that we look at. So they would take their color like purple and you're gonna run through the history of how purple is made. Uh, and you have to go back to the earliest color story, like when we first slapped our, painted our hand in yellow ochre and put it on the cave wall. Or so what is, what is the history of dye and, and the technologies of dye making? And what does that have to do with the economies of the country? So like what happened to Cochineal and Oaxaca and you know, that goes worldwide into the, the color trade around the world. And how about the silk, silk tr trade routes and the indigo? And so this is a huge story. And it is, as you're saying, it's like the, the politics of color and the economics of color are immense. And so people called it um, merely decorative. You're like, think again, think again, because it ain't merely decorative. So like just, just that one, one story would go back to politics in the um, Tyrolean coast. This is the early, um, early uh, economy of, of Greece and Romans. And this was the, the little shellfish, the little murex shellfish. And how many thousands of pounds of those shellfish it takes to make one, one piece of dye so that you would only, that would be legislated color for these sumptuary laws, like only certain people could wear them. And if you wore any purple and you weren't supposed to, you could have, you could either have your hands cut off, be put to death, um, you know, because you're actually not, it meant that you were saying something about who you were that you weren't supposed to. So that, those laws are remarkably powerful. And they're still actually, not that we get our hands cut off for wearing purple, now, but you kind of got to, it's still really political. Very much so, very much so. I wanted to jump into this slide here, Michelle. Um, you had given us this beautiful shade of pink. Um, can you speak a little bit more to where this is going and why this is important? Well, pink is thought of as demure and feminine, or I should say pink was thought of as demure and feminine. 
pink is a part of the fashion politics, and it recently had a millennial makeover. It is one of the most gender fluid colors as of yet to date. So pink has its political statements. Pink has a power statement depending on the shade that we choose. So in its darker shades with vibrance, it is a power, a ambiance, a strong, a strength color. And then we also use pink on the retail floor when we are trying to present a switch between seasons and even more so when we come to how is how are political messages being translated by pink we have to look at what are the fashions for a cause movements that we are using pink and right now uh, one of the most prominent causes would be breast cancer awareness in which we use pink mm -hmm. so pink has more of a statement than we've given it in the past i would agree absolutely our transition months in fashion typically happen on the J months, so January, June, July. And so when, if you go into uh, the stores around that time, you'll see various shades of pink worked into the palette um, to help transition from your fall to spring. So we kind of precede your spring desire with a little bit of lightness, um, maybe still in your sweater, but it's still in pink. Um, or maybe another color that kind of helps you to you know, know that you know, spring is on the way or it's, you're wanting spring to get here sooner. Um, but then June, July is really an opportunity to kind of introduce that you know, to change seasons again. I'd have to say what we've experienced most recently is fashion is responsible for rescuing pink out of its stereotypes. Yes. It, 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 it's really interesting how that works and I mean because we, we've talked about um, in the early 20th century in the in United States the the marketing of pink that's when that was codified and you know be, that was really basically for the baby boomer generation all these little kids like hey you know what if you have one baby and it's a boy then if you code everything in blue then then if, if you, everybody was allowed to wear blue then you just keep the same stuff if you have a girl and like hey it's a girl now you gotta get all this new stuff it's like, oh, okay. So it just kind of it worked in marketing, you know. And also, then it became problematic because then it's like, oh, that's a boy, that's a girl, and girls are supposed to be this, and boys are supposed to be that. And you look at the toys in Target or, or something, and you're like, Damn. you know, it's like all these bright, saturated red, yellow, blues for boys, and then the pink and the purples and the unicorns and the dazzly stuff for the girls. It's like I'm not saying that's wrong, but it's like it's really just set for us. So we're just trying to say you can you can actually take some stuff back. You can claim new territory. We don't have to be that way. Right. You know, and I think I think that's really powerful. And, and just one other quick point, Nina, when you were talking about I love that. I didn't know that about pink. See? About the seasons and the pink and the stores. But you know when when I was in thinking about how we live our lives, spring is always the light colors, right? The, the light just sort of comes up. It's we've had a harsh, you know, cold winter it's not as, and then, then by the summer, the colors start to get more saturated, and the beach balls come out, and the bright colors, and then the fall, they go away, and we get the browns and the oranges and the Thanksgivings, and it goes into Christmas. So with, we live in a color-coded world, and we mimic that with our things. It's Absolutely. not just being, you know. I would agree with that. And I think kind of on the topic of being in a color-coded world, um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about how we bring um, the concept to the product. You know, we work with product life cycle management. Um, this is something where we really go through um, a product development cycle that starts with concept. It goes to technical design and material sourcing, material purchasing for prototyping, product, uh, the development and testing, technical design and revisions, and then we finally get to the final production prototypes, pre-production prototypes. Um, Michelle, can you tell us a little bit more about like how this is being integrated with like new technology and how you know where Luann's world collides with fashion in this space? Well, once upon a time ago, back in little <laughs> rural year, um, <laughs> this kind of technology was not available to me as a designer. Uh, we had to physically have the paint chips in hand. We'd take a photo, of course the saturation would not come out as well. Uh, with uh, the recent Gerber Unique PLM, you're able to establish a color palette and mix and make your own colors. And really, it's a tool of fashion forecasting. It's a tool for the industry, the heart of the industry itself. 
But the forecasting of it is, I'd have to say, the key point to be able to choose and pick your own colors and bring that into a palette in the system at the same time that gets fed in the system to all of the rest of the industry once you generate that package. But I have color forecasters in the room right now. Raise your hand. Should everyone be raising their hand? Where are my color forecasters? I'm going to say this gentleman right here is a color forecaster. <laughs> Uh, let's let's think about what will be the color for 2030. <laughs> All right, I got another color forecaster right here. Yes, you. Well, get, give me a color for 2050. Go for it. Go for it. You said red. You're absolutely right. <laughs> in forecasting, we end up choosing different shades of red or even the same red, but it is about the target market that you're selling to. So red for the ladies market may be called rose petal, whereas in for the male market, it may be called fireball. It is about targeting into your Consumer, their lifestyle, their brand, their demographics. And that's where the psychology comes into play. So I want to dial back a bit. So with product lifecycle management, that's what the PLM stands for. PLM, product lifecycle management. Um, what happens in that space that doesn't happen ordinarily? Like, you know, it's a digital platform to manage concept to sale, but what, what happens in that space where we get a chance to apply art to product? An entire library that's hard to obtain on your own of thousands, if not close to a million different shades of color that have been cataloged and numbered and already named by Pantone. You know, for what we do in design, what's always so challenging is that what we would normally do is we'd go in and we'd say, okay, well, I need to mix all my color, or I need to find that color represented in the real world somewhere, share color standards, cut them up, send them overseas. Has, has anyone done this? Um, you cut up color, you send it to the, the manufacturer, you say, this is the color we want to stand for. They dye it up, they send it back to you. It kind of looks like what you asked for. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, potential for being lost in translation. And one of the things that we love about product by cycle management software is that a lot of that translation gets dealt with in one space. And so what we're doing is we're actually teaching product lifecycle management software right here at ACC as a part of our Gerber Technology Apparel Computer Systems um, program um, where you get a chance to get access to that. So that's happening this summer, right, Michelle? Like that's Correct. The, okay, awesome. <laughs> we're, we're excited. We can't wait to deliver that class. We're going to jump into Q&A in just a second, but we have um, a few additional things we wanted to talk about. So we wanted to look a little closer at the capsule. So can you just tell us quickly, Luann, um, about the various components of the capsule for a hero's journey? Yes. So this, this is the series that it's, is I'm choosing to launch the, my, my Art for Daily Life brand. So this is the first time that I'm, I'm so excited about being able to bring the art into other forms. And I don't see that as being one's being commercial and the other's not. I see it all being art and the idea that art is not stuck in the studio. And I, could, I, I couldn't do this um, without, I, I went, when ACC Fashion Incubator, I've been, I've been learning about it, I knew it was coming, and I was like, I have to, if, if I don't have this, this PLM, the product, is that right? Mm -hmm. Product life cycle management. Product life cycle management, because I'm coming from studio, I don't know. I couldn't do this. I could not make this happen. It would be a pipe dream, I couldn't do it. So I, I, I'm so welcome under, you know, being able to, being able to bring this in. So I had to begin to think about, um, it just made sense for me to have it be the hero that would launch it because I'm saying, you know, it's, it, it's a hero's journey for all of us and we need to um, be able to be in, in tune with mother nature. That's what she says to us. Hold your head high. 
um, carry your leaf back to the colony, work together, and also to celebrate the arts. So it's like this is a new lifestyle. So that I think we coming out of Austin, mm -hmm. the idea that we can actually represent, I feel like that's what we do, that we, a holistic life si psych, uh, lifestyle, that, that that's how we can live and we can embrace the arts and celebrate that. So, but I have in, in, the, in September, that's when I'm going to do the launch for the first capsule collection. So it's that would exciting. be, yeah, and I think it's, this was what I'm going to do. I was thinking about the color codes in black. Um, September is leading into the darker parts of the year, right? So the idea of, of, of the solstice coming on and then the beauty of the dark um, and being able to really let that um, just wrap around you. And then the rose, that's, you see the rose, the rose is not, she's walking by the rose bush because in the darkest part of the night, um, she's being rewarded that, that you know, there, there is beauty, there is great beauty. And, and the rose, sort of abstracted rose petals are falling down, you know, to, to sort of shower her. So that, that actually can turn into, there, there is a series of 12 different times of day and that one is the deepest part of the night. So I can choose, you know, which time of day. It's really beautiful. I feel like the, the way that you've rendered you know, the various components of the ant, the leaf, the rose petals, the night, you know, I feel like you can see how easy it is to put it into product, you know, whether it's uh, hanging over the bed or an accent pillow or the sheets, you know, I love how it's translated here in the tunic dress, you know, where it's almost like a, it's a, like an oversized sweater tunic that kind of falls over an asymmetrical skirt or um, you have it here in the mug, you know, I think that this really kind of translates to a lot of different places that you can kind of, where the art can show up. And I think it's a really brilliant application of how you utilize the color and the art and the message to really connect authentically to the customer. I, oh, thank you so much, Nina. And when I first talked to Nina and Michelle, and we, they, I just, I, we, we so resonated on this idea of, of the hero's journey and the, and the need to be able to connect together with that and, and, I, and the power of art to do that. So for me to be able to make the transition into home, that's what I'm saying. I, I believe that home is the earth and, um, and we take care of ourselves, our planet, we take work together. So I just think, you know, this is, these, these are, I'm gonna use another color term, code red times. You know, this is a tough time. So we need to, I think it's, it's we don't have the leisure just to sit around and wring our hands and say, what should we do? Um, it's, it, but it's to say, well, here's what we can do. We work together. You know, we're going to all take our leaves back home to the colony. We're not going to run behind the nearest tree and gobble it up ourselves, you know. Like, so it's like reminding us our, about what is beautiful and what is important and that we can do that by our, through, through fashion, through home fashion. I think when we wake up in our homes, we're surrounded by a color. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay, so how many of you, and this is not a quiz, how many of you made your choices this morning based on the colors in your closet? Oh, come on. All right. I was feeling kind of blue today. Not in a bad way. I was feeling like wearing blue. Power so, blue. <laughs> so I can see someone felt like wearing red. Power color. Oh, well, this is a amber leaf original. Uh, by the way, Miss um, Liz Sakura, Lisa, Lisa, her daughter's Liz, but this is Lisa Sakura. If you'd like to stand up, she's the designer of the coat that I'm wearing today. <laughs> Thank you. And who else made their decision based on how they felt as they reached in their closet and made a selection by color? Okay. So, these I, see are some, I see some black and white polka dots that are speaking Where? pretty loud. Oh, right there, right black and white polka dots. Yes, a actually. Beautiful choice, ladies. Clean slate, favorites. And these are the choices that we make based on how we feel. Now, some of us say, hey, hey the uh, clothes were clean, so I picked them up. <laughs> um, I've had some of those moments. I, I can't lie about that. But most of all, it's an emotional choice, an emotional decision when we go to interviews, so to speak. We're looking for colors that establish trust, security, earnestness. We're going to pick a navy blue, perhaps. Yes, we will. We want to se select something that makes us feel comfortable, energetic. When we go into, let's say, for example, Lowe's, orange. You feel like hanging around in Lowe's a little bit longer than you should, don't you? 
it's because of that orange. There's a comfort zone as well as caution with the color orange. Actually, Lowe's is the blue and Home Depot is the oh. orange. They'd be like, Look, I, I should um, uh, apologize to <laughs> whomever is the marketing for that team. Because <laughs> Lowe's, I think they, they want us to hang out a little longer in Home Depot's. Get the hell out of here and go home and do your project. Yes, but you, you want to hang out and buy more because of a color. There's definitely influence that happens for the consumer, and we definitely <laughs> make choices from the design, from the space, all of those things in order to communicate that. Um, I do want to um, get into just one last um, question before you jump into question and answer. Um, you know, how does product, so, you know, we love the saturation of color. This cobalt reminds me a lot of the beautiful cobalt that you're wearing, Michelle. Um, you know, if we could really, like, give one takeaway from, you know, this talk about how art and, you know, product are speaking to one another, um, what would you guys, what would you leave our audience with today? Um, I will say, I, it, in addition to the color, it, one thing is, know that it's not, because I get this question all the time, art, color is not for, just for artists, it's like, you know, it's for everybody. And it always has been, and, it, oh, and that's what it should be. So, but the color doesn't live by itself; it lives in things. So it's the pattern, and you know, and what is what is the image, you know, and, and how big is it, how small is it? So I think it's just like allow yourself to just relax into it, and and if some, and you'll notice if you stop worrying about like, oh, I don't know anything about color, because actually you start knowing about color as soon as you open your eyes. And we know, I, I always say that when we're talking, like you know so much more about color than you ever thought you knew. And the marketers know we know too. We just don't think we know. So it's like, just allow yourself to respond and, and, and check out. When you see something, you're like, oh, I like that. Or like, I don't really like. So if it's something for yourself, just allow yourself to think about what those colors you know, do for you. And then also to experiment and play and, and bring in something like, you know, bring a color in you didn't have and just let that and play with that for a little while because a lot I think it really does enrich our lives in so many ways. For me I like to go back to things that I hear people say around me or that I'm just kind of eavesdropping here around me whichever way you want to want to paint the story haha uh -huh, paint no pun intended. No. <laughs> when people say I'm not into fashion or I'm not a fashion person the fact that you walked into any place in public with clothes on your body <laughs> means you are a fashion person. It took someone like us to create that t-shirt and jeans or the tank top, anything you're like, oh, well, it's not trendy. Well, it, it's a staple. That's what it's called to the retail world. It is a staple favorite that earns money on the floor time and time again. I don't care if it's Hanes or Victoria's Secret. It's a staple favorite that is needed. And most of all, don't be afraid of color. I was afraid of color in my New York days. Every time I wear black, morning, noon, night, when there was a black out, I'd reach and I had no fear. I was like, it doesn't matter if it matches, it's all black, just reaching cars and glad. But most of all, as I came out of my fear of color, I embraced it, right? Okay. So <laughs> don't be afraid of color and, and don't be afraid to say that, yes, you are into fashion. You have clothes on your body. It is fashion. Maybe it's not something that you call as trendy or couture, but it is a part of this industry. Yes, and I would also say, it, just tagging right onto that, um, we all know, we're crazy to, to not, ad I mean, we are conscious of how we present ourselves. There are, there are very deep, deeply rooted reasons why we do what we do, you know, and, and it makes a huge difference. It's, psycho it's psychology and it's behavior and everybody has to know about that. And there's a, two terms that are really cool about this. Um, chromophobia is a fear of color. So if you have chromophobia, and every, I, mean, I hear it all the time, people are like, ooh, I don't know. So, you know, the way to, to get over chromophobia is to practice chromotherapy. <laughs> so just letting color into your life and playing with it and being, you know, and, and, and just watching what pleases you and watching, and basically watching what nature does. Nature is a, a, just a master, a mistress of mother nature is the best. So just like watching that. So I think that, yeah, just be open to the beauty around us. I love that. Let's give our two guests a round of applause.
Thank you both. Um, what we're going to do now, th what we're going to do now is we're going to open up for question and answer. So I saw a couple of hands go up earlier. Um, we do have a microphone that's coming around. Thank you. Um, so if you don't mind just speaking into the microphone so we can all hear. Hi, my name is Rebecca. I work at Stitch Texas. I'm a pattern maker and a technical designer. You didn't need to know that, but I'm telling you anyways. <laughs> um, so my question is, for your PLM system, and, and we can all see it here, when we saw the images of Luann's art, and if you compared those images on the screen to the pictures on the sides, you could tell that the color was not the same. So how do you mitigate the differentiation between a printed color or a painted color or a chemically adapted color between the screen, what you see on the screen, the RGB colorways that we see on the screen, or CYN, whatever it is, uh, to the physical outcome. I can take it if yeah. you want. <laughs> so um, normally what happens in product lifecycle management software is that the industry aligns to accepted standards. And what we normally do is we align those standards to Pantone. And Pantone has an incredible library of color that's been coded for various shades and casts and levels and intensities. And we say, okay, although what I see on the screen is, looks like this, the color that I'm expecting to get from the factory, regardless of how it's being rendered, should look like the accepted color. So what the factory has to do is they actually have to change the dye stuffs or the levels of blue or yellow to be able to create the green. Um, they're going to have to change the way that it's applied to um, the material, whether it's synthetic or natural, um, to be able to match that color. So what normally happens is you get a back and forth between you and the mill who's creating the fabric or you and the factory who's creating the goods. And that's actually accepted or not by the designer or the product developer over time. And so it's really important to kind of create that dialogue, but what's really awesome about PLM is that it allows that dialogue to happen in one central location. So instead of trying to keep track of color notes over email or color notes through an Excel spreadsheet that needs to be constantly updated by you know, a poor design assistant somewhere, at least in one place in product lifecycle management software, we're all having the same conversation at the same time. Exactly. So what product lifecycle management software does is it allows you to converge all of your contacts and vendors into one space. So the design team, the production team, the buying team, your mill who's managing your materials, the, um, the color specialist who's d doing all of the dye lots, the, um, you know, your factory who's doing the sample iterations, all of the content that happens is in one place. So the moment you update your product, as a designer and concept, and you say, okay, now I'm ready for the pattern maker or the, or the technical designer to take on, then it closes for the designer and opens up for the technical space. And then the technical designer checks off and says, I'm finished, it closes for the technical designer, and then it opens up for the factory. The factory, wherever they may be, overseas or another state or next door, um, they open it up and they utilize that. Um, and then whenever their sample is complete, they put all their sample notes in, they've told you what the, you know, how it measures, if it's on what you requested or not. All of that stuff lives inside, you know, the fabric buy. Everything lives in that one space. So instead of you keeping up with emails and spreadsheets and all of that, it lets you manage it in one, plot, one spot. Hi, I'm Leanne. I work at Stitch Texas also. I Hi. do sourcing. <laughs> I like that Stitch is here. Thank you so much for coming. Stitch Texas in the house. At, at any rate, so, so you have one central place for all your communication. Yes. And, and, which is, is really essential. Uh, but it also relies at each location where people are feeding into this communication. Each of them has to have a set of Pantone chips. Is, is that how it, it's based? So there's still a physical chip that needs to exist in each location. So normally what happens is Pantone issues a catalog book of chips. Um, they come on paper, but they also come on cotton swatches. 
Um, most design companies rely on the cotton swatches because it seems to be more accurate for the dye stuffs needed to create the color um, for fashion. So they should have a book um, that has all of those colors available. Um, if not, they can actually order the dye stuffs for synthetic or cotton based goods or rayon based goods um, to be able to actually dye those goods against the Pantone color. Um, so it's not something where they have to manufacture what that color is supposed to be. That color is actually has a, a recipe, so to speak. And thank you to our student for um, helping us today with the microphone. <laughs> I'm, I'm really fascinated by the emotional and cultural associations with color, and it seems that colors even go through a life cycle of what they're associated with. What I wanted to know is that do um, Pantone or other color companies, do they choose a color and the association with it, or are they simply interpreting the data of the climate and then, and then they're choosing a color or, and, the, and its association? Pantone isn't necessarily going by um, an activity within, within the culture. Uh, fashion, and of course this is what most of us are living in the middle of, it is influenced by world events and things that are happening around us. Um, in World War I, World War II, which actually gave us our separates and sweaters and watches and a lot of things were made out of the innovation during the war period. Um, the camouflage color in army green came from that time but out of a necessity. So in regards to Pantone, they are choosing out of a zygist of the times. So when they choose that, they're pinpointing that as a key buy. Now if you remember, there was a time that they brought the purple rain to the forefront. And that was for honoring one of our favorite artists, Prince. And I won't yeah. sing Purple Rain, by the way. <laughs> but, <laughs> but out of that zygote of the times, they go through, will, how will we filtrate this to the general public? How will we convince them that this is the color for them? I know, let's put it in some of their basic staple, listen to me, staple favorites. T-shirt. You're not afraid of a T-shirt, are you? No, nah, it's harmless. Little old t-shirt. You trust the t-shirt. Buy it. Then we filter it into a tank top. Then maybe a button-up. Then maybe a plain skirt. Then it goes on to some couture. Maybe something elaborate as a Dior, a Brandon Maxwell, one of my favorite Texas-born designers, I'm just saying. But this is how you start to buy into that color. And then it gives you a certain feeling. Maybe all of a sudden it is your trademark signature color. Yeah, like right now, blue, my signature color. So. Hi. Um, so in the fashion world, obviously we stick to certain colors for a season. Uh, would you say that media kind of sticks to those same colors or do you think they kind of do their own thing? Could you repeat the question for me? I'm sorry. So in fashion, like we stick to uh, certain colors for the season. Would you say that media, like in terms of like movies or TV shows, would you say that they follow those same colors or do you say that they do their own thing? Personally, I would say that there are some things where it may be logo sensitive, where they will stick with their own branding. But whenever you look at like media sets and how those things are coordinated, if you look at, you know, any, Fox News or CNN or whoever it is that you watch, a lot of times when they have a panel of speakers at once, there's a coordinated effort with the color story across all of the speakers. Um, I don't, in solids. They, so yeah, so there's, there tends to not be a lot of print representation and if it is, it's kind of brought in and maybe the necktie or in the pocket square or in a scarf detail. Um, and so you do see some adaptation on, on screen um, when they have a little bit more control of the guests who are speaking at the time. Um, but I do think that there is some adaptation of connecting what's happening in real life to what's happening on screen. 
Absolutely, especially in social media, I would say. Yes, that's a good question. We, one of the speakers we had was related to color and film, and, um, and, and there's a really cool book called If It's Purple, Someone's Gonna Die, and, uh, and it's kind of true. They're actually, it's a, a film class that came out of Stanford, and they were looking at like the color codes in the movies, so I think they, all, they sort of marched to a little different drummer and depended on the story they're telling. And one of the things that I think is interesting to think about is, and they use this all the time, is is the palette dark, before you get to the hue, you know, is it pink or is it blue or is it orange or, or green, it's, is it dark? So I always like to watch the first opening scene, the very first scene of a, a film or, or, or video, and I'm like, like you can tell by that, you know, a lot, because it's, it's start, is it set in a dark note or is it a light note? You know, then you kind of know where they're going. If it's saturated color, they're going to be kind of a pick me up. You know, if it's sort of, so you can kind of tell how much warm there is, how much cool there is. So it's interesting because I, I think we 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 were really dealing with color as a very as a language, and I, I I like to talk about it in terms of visual communication. And the reason why I think it's important for everyone to study it is because it is important. We we are communicating in it all the time in everything we do. And so if, we have, if we're able to read between the lines and kind of pick up the cues, which vary from culture to culture also, and time period to time period, and you know, is it highly gendered or is it not? So I think we can learn a lot more about the message if we're able to kind of watch those codes. Real quick on the point of message and communication, your communication of color is made within the first four to five seconds that you enter a room. So keep that in mind. <laughs> well, I think that this has been an incredible conversation. I just want to thank Louie and Anne Michelle one more time. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us. So I want to close out with a few topics just for you guys to kind of um, be thinking about. Um, again, you can find us on austincc.edu backslash fashion incubator and on all handles at, at ACC fashion incubator. Um, I do want to make a couple of quick notes. We are um, definitely supported by the city of Austin in creating uh, this programming. And so economic development as well as small business has an incredible um, support for what we do here. And in that, we're actually working with them in the Austin Young Chamber to uh, do the Fast Start competition. It's a pitch competition specifically for fashion this time. And that application is open right now. So if you apply, um, it just takes just a couple of minutes. It's not a very in-depth um, application. But what you stand to win is $2,500, um, another three months um, over at Capital Factory, but we're also giving away three months at the Fashion Incubator. Um, and so it's a part of that experience. Um, I think they have up to $5,000 worth of, um, of prizes that are associated with that. And so we would strongly encourage you that if you're a fashion designer or fashion technology, to apply for that. Um, it, the deadline actually closes on Monday the 20th, so we're right up at time. It's actually a very quick application, so it's not very in-depth, um, but um, you do have to apply if you want to compete on June 25th. So that's actually held at Google. Uh, Fashion Incubator will be serving as the MC, so I'll be there, you'll see me. And um, there'll be a, a really esteemed panel of judges to help make those selections. Um, so, Again, thank you so much. We also want to let you know that uh, Luann is working on developing a group of uh, pieces alongside of this series for the hero's journey. And so we're actually going to be inviting her back uh, in September in just a few months here after she's gone through her product development, she's gone through the product life cycle, and she'll be bringing in protos and some shoppable opportunities. So you'll get a chance to see the product that actually comes out of the artwork that she's brought here for us to see today. Um, so I'm very excited to have you back, Luann, um, with a shoppable fashion hour experience. And um, I think we'll, we'll be so excited to see how those things actually translate I am so excited to do that because for all the reasons I, I could never have done it um, had it not been for the technology where we are now and this incredible sort of opportunity that we have. And I also um, want to make sure that I mention that it's due to, I, I have a grant from the Cultural Arts Council in Austin as well. And, um, and that is really helping to, it's funding me to be able to do this. So I think the city has been so supportive, especially in this, in this situation. So. It's very wonderful. exciting. Wonderful. Yeah, the city of Austin's really stepped up 
specifically in the realm of fashion. And so they're really looking for developing artists as well as you know, product development here, which is a really special time for us um, as we embark on the incubator and you know, supporting future projects like Luann's. So thank you so much again.